very special guest with us today who, uh, as I've continued to do my reading, I've discovered is um, really quite a remarkable lady in her own right, having achieved so much, with much left to achieve still. So Sue, without uh, my doing your story and injustice, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you. It's always much better when someone doesn't go through, you know, paragraphs of, of your bio, because anyone can read it. Um, but thank you, everyone. It's really great to be here. And I hope we're going to get into um, very much an open discussion, because I always think that's the best way that we can actually talk about different things. But it also helps me, because my role is as much... or you know, even more about listening as it is about telling, and I'm only one person. Um, the role I have as special representative um, is a unique role. Uh, we're only one of two countries in the world that have a role similar. New Zealand is the other one. <coughs> we actually followed New Zealand, um, and the genesis of, it, genesis of it was really to try and have someone that could be an industry voice more so in free trade agreements. Um, I think the government looked at that, and particularly because the agriculture portfolio isn't the one that deals with FTAs, it's actually the foreign affairs portfolio, um, but thought there was merit in the role. Um, so we're happy to create the role, but more about engagement with our multilateral institutions and pushing for Australia's commitment to free and open trade um, and evidence and science-based approaches to policy making. So it's fair to say when I came in, uh, probably because I've got a regulatory and policy background as well as being a farmer myself, uh, that was seen as being something that would help the role, but it's evolved considerably over the time. I think the first year I did spend a lot of time in Australia, because of COVID, we'd actually be missing at the table in terms of global interaction. And even though, um, you know, other countries were shut down for a little bit during COVID. They very quickly, particularly, you know, in Europe and the US, started to interact again. But Australia, on the other side of the world, world we shut down our borders and so we weren't able to travel and others weren't able to come here. So it was very much about relationship building. Um, we were about to sign a UK FTA at the time when I first went overseas. Um, but it was also trying to engage with other countries, see where they were at. The second year I realised just how influential the role could be because when you're an industry voice but you get access to some of the highest levels of government officials and other representatives in global markets, um, that is really quite different. Um, and industry generally doesn't get that sort of access. So I realised this is an opportunity to really be able to push the edge on getting other countries to understand where we come from, how we actually operate. And there's nothing more powerful than to be able to give hands on, hands on, down the, you know, on the ground examples of how things can work in practice. You know, and <clears throat> look, you know, I, I said this um, probably 12, it might have been two years ago, uh, and got into a bit of trouble for it. But I was giving an example about speaking to uh, House of Commons in the UK, and I was asked, how much lamb are we going to get from mules sheep? And I said, well, probably very little, because we don't mules our lamb sheep. It's more our wool sheep. And you could see from their faces they didn't understand that. If, if I was a government official or, you know, and I had someone from DFAT and DAF there, they, they, would, they wouldn't have known to actually respond. This actually took us to a really interesting discussion with the MPs around the difference. And then I explained about merino sheep and why they were bred with the folds in them. I explained about our climate. I explained about the fact that we get lots of flies and that from an animal welfare perspective, it was far better to mules than to see them die a slow, painful death in the paddock. That was a revelation for them. And that was probably my first insight to seeing how influential this role can be when you actually can get those voices that actually can explain things to people um, that really don't know any different. And particularly in the UK and the EU, the power of the, the NGOs is immense. So fact quite often gets drowned out by myth. The third year now, which I'm into, a long introduction, isn't it? Um, I'm actually seeing now, how do we actually do this role collectively? It can't be just about me and one person. It's how do we actually bring everyone together? And that's on a number of levels. Um, firstly, in communication, which is really important. How do we actually communicate about the great things that Australian agriculture is doing? 
both domestically and overseas. And I'd, I'd be really interested for, you know, to hear how some of you are actually cutting through in that area. Secondly, when it comes to policy, how do we actually influence policy both domestically and globally in terms of standards to make sure that it's fit for purpose for how we farm here, but how we really want to go in the future around sustainability, around climate, around environmental stewardship, around animal welfare. Um, and thirdly, how do we actually make sure that people understand the importance of Australian agriculture and take a whole systems approach? You can't actually pull a lever in one particular area and not think it has consequences in others. And we tend to do things in silos, whether that's at the government level, whether it's across our industry sectors um, or commodities, but how do we actually get that holistic narrative around Australian agriculture? I'll leave it there and let you go to your... Well, I mean, there's place. a little bit to unpack there. I, I think... Um, I remember Richard Simonator saying this one day from AGIC, um, the power of words and the challenge around what we might refer to something as and what other people would refer to something as. And his example was, was a farm dam. Um, when you talk to Europeans about a dam, they're talking about water supply and holding rivers back. A farm dam is something we capture small water on and it's, it's a pond. How do you deal with circumstances where you, you're essentially almost re-educating the audience that you're working with because there's a breakdown in, te in terminology about what is otherwise a common agricultural practice. And I think this is one of our challenges we have globally, particularly when we look at the global rules and standards, and that is they can't just be set by definitions that are set for one particular country or one particular region. Uh, because how we farm our production uh, processes and practices, our environmental conditions are quite different. So we've really got to take a very much outcomes approach. Um, and it's why, you know, and for those of you who've heard me speak before, I do push hard back against the EU legislation, the farm to fork, the Green Deal, because it is quite prescriptive and it doesn't actually recognise that others actually farm quite differently. You know, as I'm a beef farmer, we open graze in Europe, a lot of their, their livestock are kept in barns. Now, we would actually say it's far better for the animal to be open grazing. But because of the open grazing, it means we have to have different animal welfare practices. We use um, drenches and vaccines differently to what you might do if you actually had barn um, raised animals. So it really has to be a recognition of that. And what we end up getting confronted with is that we get challenged with the fact that we have poor animal welfare practices or poor pesticides and chemical use when actual fact it's, it's different. So we're not quite cutting through there in terms of the why. So the narrative is really important. But it's also important to think about, and look, I, I took this away from, from Beef Week and it was, it was a narrative on the first day. And that was, you've actually got to touch the hearts of people first and then back it up with the heads. So I talked about my first year as being really focused on evidence and science-based. And I think that's absolutely correct. You do have to have the facts that sit behind it. But maybe we go in too hard with the facts and figures to start with, and you've actually got to appeal to people's hearts and say... So that's a really interesting point. I mean, Australian agriculture has for a long time done passion very well. Um, and we're seeing, particularly now with the live sheep debate, uh, where we have very passionate advocates for the continuing to practice the way they're practicing. But one of the key arguments that, that advocates for the live sheep trade have is that the science supports what they're doing. I was having this conversation with somebody last night, but um, we, we cherry pick science to suit our purposes. How do we do what the Environment Minister here in New South Wales likes to say? You know, we agree the facts. How do we get to a point where we can agree that there are some things that are co totally non-controversial and we'll quibble about the things on the edges rather than finding ourselves <coughs> stuck in this rut where we're arguing over essentially the same thing? Look, evidence-based policy is what we all want to see and robust policy making. And robust policy making is about making sure, and look, in the end, it will be the decision makers of the elected people who will make that final decision, but they're provided with all the facts and the evidence and the cost benefit analysis to make that decision. Um, I've worked a lot in regulatory reform. There are best practice regulatory guidelines. They're not always adhered to, 
whether that's at the state or the federal level. And if we actually adhere to that in terms of what is the outcome you're trying to achieve. And one of the biggest mistakes I think we, that we see ma being made is that you jump to the solution without actually identifying what the problem is in the first place. And, that, and good policy making is about identify the problem and then identify options for the solution. And one of those options is a status quo or do nothing. And, and so I think there are processes in place that aren't always adhered to, and what that requires is the data. On the other hand, and particularly when we look at environmental practices and sustainability, we're behind on the data. In pockets, there's data that has been collected, but we need to get much better at that. And whose responsibility is that? Is that a job for government? Is it a job for the lobby groups? Is it a job for the individual farmers? Who's the responsible, who's the group who's got to be the sort of taking the charge to make that happen? So I think it's a shared responsibility. Um, we've got to get the data, but farmers, particularly SMEs, and in certain sectors there are a lot more SMEs than, than there are other corporates, um, they're already time poor, they're already doing a huge amount in terms of compliance. So we need to find ways that we can actually leverage existing systems to be able to say, can we actually use those systems, such as the accounting packages and the tax packages? You know, doing your BAS, well, can you actually get the data out of those accounting systems that actually report on sustainability measures? But also, how do we use technology and AI to be able to provide the data back? Remote sensing, satellite imagery, um, RFIDs, that actually can get that data and provide that back to farmers and then say, you can verify this and maybe add on. At the corporate level, because we have legislation that was supposed to come in on 1 July, the climate related financial disclosures, that's now been, it is likely to be delayed 12 months. But the corporate end is really getting their act together around data and reporting and measurement. They and their clients are actually working on this. So they're actually paying for people in their supply chain to get this information and we've just got to get that more widespread. <coughs> and I think what I've seen, which has been for me very reassuring, is when I was having the conversation with some of the agribusiness corporates 12 to 18 months ago, when it came to me talking about their tools and calculators and their data, it was all keep it to themselves because it was corporate you know, confidence, this is our client information. Now I'm seeing the much more willingness to say, well, actually, we're all on the same page here. Let's share what we're doing. Let's come up with common calculators and common tools. I think the other big thing that if we actually can use AI and tech to provide the data back is you get around this privacy issue where if farmers actually gather the data themselves, then they're concerned about who they provide it to. If it's actually data that is readily available, then you won't necessarily have that issue. So I want to um, just flex the conversation a little bit. Um, you were in the paper last week talking about whether we, whether people understand how we're perceived internationally. So would you take a moment to hold a mirror up to Australian agriculture and tell us what it is our competitors, uh, how our competitors are telling our story and what are the competitive advantages and disadvantages? Look, that's really challenging because if I was to hold a mirror up, as a farmer myself, I know what my practices are. I, look, they've changed, and I've been, I've been on my farm for 32 years, they've changed over the time. But it's always about continuous improvement, improving your animal welfare, improving your pesticide use, improving your chemical use, looking at soil testing so you actually minimise that. And we are, in Australia, one of the very few farmers in the world that are not subsidised. So we don't have perverse incentives to try and use more chemicals or pesticides that they do in some countries. So it costs us. We're not going to use more of it than we absolutely need to because it just doesn't make sense. We've got to be thinking about profitability. We also know if we don't look after our land, it won't be there for the next generation. So, so there are a whole lot of incentives built into our free and open trade system that actually supports sustainability. What really, I look at, it makes me despair at times when I'm in certain countries, and particularly the EU, and I hadn't thought about it in the UK, but I've heard about this more recently, is they don't think that office. They don't think we're as clean and green as we like to think we are. And I don't know if some of the reasons are that we've been overtaken. Ireland is making a huge effort 
to really get the clean green, the origin green is their brand. They've got a very cohesive R&D system, so one R&D body. They've got one branding body called Board Beer and that does the branding and marketing for all of Ireland. So they give very much a Team Ireland approach. We have a system that has been built on industry sectors and commodities. And I think diversity is great, but we've got to find a way that we can embrace diversity, but still give a, mes a consistent message, particularly globally. Because we often hear this, that we've got Brand Australia, yet we're all then very quickly to run off and say, but within Brand Australia, there is, you know, apples from Victoria are better than New South Wales or whatever the case might be. So, so are we, are what you're saying, we're essentially our own worst enemy in our own, in our own effort to try and diversify, we're actually doing ourselves a disadvantage or to causing ourselves a, dis, a disadvantage. And look, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in feedback from the room here because, you know, all of you are experts in this area and I certainly not. But it, it is the messaging and looking at it through the lens of the consumer the client, the customer, what are they hearing? Why are they not hearing that we are clean and green? Why are they not hearing that we have world leading best practice in animal welfare, you know, in, in our technology, in our climate smart agriculture? Why are they not hearing that? Is that how we're packaging the messaging? Or do we need more of you? I mean, the government's spending $15 million in your, in the initiative of global agricultural leadership. Um, is it that, that to play on Team Australia, you've got to pay to play and the government needs to be funding more or do farmers have to put their hand in their pocket? I mean, somebody's, at some point, someone's got to pay. So who does the responsibility fall upon? Look, this is something that I'm really putting into my narrative. And, and I thought about this last year. I spent the last six months of last year almost <coughs> overseas exclusively. And then I've spent the last six months only in Australia because it's so important for me to hear from industry and engage with industry and learn what's happening on the ground. Um, and I I'm, I'm keep saying now I'm recruiting because this can't be about one person. And if the government was to fund it, what are they going to do? Fund another five people? You know, no, we want the, all the people that are out there doing great things now to actually be part of the conversation, the narrative that we need to put forward. So as an example of that, I'm going to be in Europe. I'm heading over there at the end of next week. The NFF are actually coming on this trip. We're not doing everything together but we're starting to actually look at how we can have morphous in country. I've reached out to Nuffield scholars and I've had a couple of them actually come back to me and say, well, actually, we're going to be in Europe. So I've said, well, let's look at what are the, the meetings you can come to um, so that we can share that. So I'm on a big recruitment drive because it's got to be all of us that actually work in the sector. And the thing that I think is really important about this is I've been given the most fantastic opportunity and the privilege to have a voice in fora I wouldn't normally get. Others can have a voice and what I would like to see is that government backs the voice in being in the sort of fora that I get the privilege to be in. So I'm going to throw the questions from the floor in a minute. I've got one more question for you though. Um, if you were God uh, or, and, or you had a magic wand, whichever one you'd prefer to be, and you could wave it and change something to make Australian agriculture more sustainable or, or more um, better understood on the global stage, what, what would you wave your magic wand or what would you, you push in order to achieve that objective? We have the opportunity, particularly with the work that we've done in technology, to be world leaders in this area. So to be recognised at that and as that and have others actually come to us and what will then follow is that they will then see what we do on the ground. When you actually invite people from overseas, be that farmers or government people, and you bring them here and you take them out on farm, their view changes completely. So how do we, you know, get the show and tell and feel and smell to so many of them? Because they they only make judgments of what they read and hear. And it's not just overseas. I was at a board meeting earlier this week. It's not an ag board. I was talking to a fellow director and she said to me, I'm vegetarian now. And I said, why? And she said, because my three girls won't eat meat. And I said, why? And she said, because they can't bear to, bear to eat anything that's been killed. And I said, well, 
you're actually not providing the best example. I've known you for 20 years. You know how good Australian agriculture is. Would you not be setting a better example if you said, well, actually, girls, you can eat vegetables, I'm going to eat meat, because I know that it's sustainably grown, it's sustainably sourced, it has lead, world-leading best practices. So, so I don't I know how we get that. I had the conversation with somebody the other week who said they were pescatarian because uh, we were cutting down too many trees in Queensland to graze animals. And I said, I've got some news for you, I'm sorry. Uh, and this person worked in ag. And, and so you think to yourself, if, we're, if, we are, if within the industry, we're not being our best advocates. I've got no choice. If anybody in here is a pescatarian, that's not a reflection on, in, on anybody. There's nothing wrong. I mean, fish, fish is agriculture as well. But, um, you know, the, the, it, this is not a... This can't be zero sum. So we've got to be... We've all got to be on Team Australia, I guess, if we're going to achieve yeah. your... Wave your magic wand. Now, I'm going to hand the microphone over. Uh, George is going to be Barrel Girl. So um, just if you wouldn't mind, please, saying um, who you are and where you're from. Uh, and um, keep your questions short. Steve Bignall, personal, um, no, MLA. Um, but the question is, with, uh, we hear a lot about sustainability, how Australia has to do more. If we, sh if we sh put the mirror up, some of the countries wouldn't reflect that well on us. Is that a very Euro-centric view? The EU's not a big trade partner for agriculture. If you go to Southeast Asia, that Australia is front, Australia is, you know, front and centre as a brand, and, and the sustainability question doesn't even come up. So we actually are, are winning it in sort of some of those growing, developing markets, and, and we are still uh, team gr green. It, it sort of seems like an industry we sort of put ourselves down because we're comparing ourselves to just the one sort of standard which is coming out of Europe. Yeah. Look, you're absolutely right. And our, our growing markets are going to be in Southeast Asia. Uh, that's where you've got to grow middle class, you've got, you know, the, the growing ability to pay and, and that's where we need to look to. The thing with Europe is that they are highly influential on global standards and that is the biggest concern for us. So a lot of the pushback is really to try and get that influence to be less so. And they, their thinking also can influence the thinking in Southeast Asia. So I'll give you two examples. Um, I was in Japan probably 18 months ago. They were looking to Europe in terms of sustainability frameworks because they thought the Europeans were the only people in the world who were working on this. So I talked to them about the Australian Agriculture Sustainability Framework and they didn't even know it existed, but they were really interested in that. So, so you know, it's how they actually were perceived and I think we've, we've actually got to be doing more here. And then um, China. So China, happy to take our wool, not really concerned about whether it's mulesed or non-mulesed. Europe pays a premium for mules, for non-mulesed wool. That could be an influencer if Europe then says, we're only going to take non-mules wool. Well, then China will say, well, we're only going to scour and take non-mules wool. So it's, it's the influence that the EU can have. I would love to see how we can be more influential. I think we can't do it on our own. So um, some of the work I do <coughs> with what we call like-minded countries, you know, and that's either through the Cairns Farm Leaders Group or through other global initiatives, um, is to work with the Latins, with Canada, um, and with some of the others to say, as a block, how can we actually start to push back against some of these? Because it's really hard to do it on our own. Pinch your microphone for a minute. How do you, uh, how, how do you successfully do that? I mean, the Europeans have spent centuries exporting their problems, um, and and then making everybody sit back and do the things they want done. They want things done their way. Does there come a point where the the suppliers of the raw materials or the the foodstuffs that are going into Europe sit back and say, we're not going to play your game anymore. If you want that, that's fine. But we we just simply can't be supplied. Therefore, you're on your own. Look, there are ways that we can try and do it. You don't always know if you're going to succeed. I'm, an, a, I'm a supreme optimist, so I always say, let's have a go. Um, in this role, I've actually been able to see how we can actually look to get a global narrative. So, for example, 12 months ago, at the end of last year, um, I presented the Australian, the AASF, the Sustainability Framework, 
to a global forum, a global policy forum. And there are a lot of people that said, this is actually really good. This is an overarching framework about what you're doing in Australia around sustainability. And I was having a conversation, I'm going to Canada in July, and I was having a conversation with some of the Canadians last week in preparation for that, and they said, our government has just put out a policy statement where they want us to develop a sustainability framework. Can we work with you, Australia, partner with you, because we look to your sustainability framework as being the benchmark, and that is something that we could maybe expand globally. So that's something I'm going to push when I'm in Ottawa, but then I'm also speaking at a global policy food forum a week after. There's one in Washington and then there's one in, um, in Brisbane. So I will start to talk up that because if we can find ways that globally we're seeing as being leading best practice, that can't be a bad thing. Hopefully that then will lead to us being able to say, and we're not just good at sustainability frameworks, we're actually really good at all these other things. <coughs> so Andrew Marshall from um, Australian Community Media, uh, Rural Press. And I could probably ask you about half a dozen questions and I don't know where to start here, but how do you perceive the, and you're talking about uh, Europeans not understanding us, understanding us as agriculture in Australia. We've got a huge problem in WA now where we've got a government that seemingly is under pressure because Australians don't understand it, whether they're the, the, the daughters of your friend who are eating uh, red meat or, or whatever. How, what, what's, uh, you know, how do you see that live sheep situation turning now? I mean, we've got uh, a potential ban fairly soon on, uh, on, on sheep export trade and, and I think we've discussed that, you know, that's, it's not just the sheep export trade to long distances and it's, it, that means that short distance sheep exports could, could well be next. That means cattle to Indonesia, as everyone's worried about. How do we turn that that narrative around, or, or where do you think we've gone wrong, or what do you think we should be doing apart from running tractors into Perth today to try and show the point? Is, can you, at the risk of asking you to <laughs> answer that, can you sort of give us something fairly, fairly succinct? Um, <laughs> so it, it's a bit hard to be succinct with, uh, with that uh, question, and I do have to put a couple of caveats first. So I am a live core board director and LiveCore is the RDC for, for live export and as the RDC we are involved with research and development and we work closely with MLA. Uh, MLA does you know in-country training and you know leads the best practice and we are best practice in the world. So my comments are really more as an individual even probably less so in the special rep role. Um, one of the challenges always is to when the horse is bolted, um, it's a bit hard to pull it back. And mortalities on ships are lower than mortalities in trucks and in paddocks. That has been for a long time, but a lot of work has been done to reduce those mortalities on ship. Um, you know, to have independent observers, there's been so much work that has been done, but a lot of that came after some of the agitation that has happened on ships previously. Whenever we look at, and this is not just policy, you know, in agriculture, it's policy across the board, but focusing on agriculture, we've actually got to be looking over the horizon. This is just good mi risk mitigation for, for any business. What could be coming over the horizon? How do we actually prepare for that, mitigate it? How do we actually get the facts out there so we actually have a better understanding of what we do and how we do it. I've actually, you know, been concerned that once the sheep decision was made, then activists would turn to cattle. And, you know, I've been involved with the RDCs for a long time and so I've seen it happen with caged eggs, I've seen it happen with sow stalls, you know, I, and, and it, it gets very unpleasant we've actually got to be thinking constantly about where is the consumer going? Where is the consumer's thinking? And get that early. And, you know, I'm not young. It's, it's how do we actually connect and find the way that young people think? Is it what, where they're getting this in school? Is it where they're getting it from social media? I, I don't know, but some of their views are quite strongly formed when they're quite young. And then it's hard to actually change them. 
So it's, it's a really hard question to answer, but you know, if I think of all the policy, I, I had one success, and Bev Jordan, who sits over there, would have been someone who, you know, helped in the campaign. When Bev was at New South Wales Farmers and I was at the NFF, we actually got a former treasurer to overturn a piece of legislation. That is unusual, but that has always given me hope that you continue to advocate because you may in the end get that to happen. Um, very rarely does happen. Um, so you've got to be on the front foot and you've got to be thinking about what's coming and try and be prepared for it.